101.5 FM proudly presents The Community Kitchen with Annette Long. Welcome to Community Kitchen. We're all talking about the cold at the moment. When I left the farm this morning, it was uh, four degrees, so I don't want anyone complaining about how cold it is in uh, Caboolture. By the time I hit Kilcoy, it was 10, and I think he is about 16, so we really are in freeze zone. We talked about insect farming for food a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, and uh, I loved finding this in the paper. You can actually buy insect snacks now, and uh, Thai green curry crickets and barbecue flavoured worm crisps. So there you go, guys. We mentioned it a few weeks ago on uh, 101.5, and of course now you can actually buy them. We're debating before whether or not you'd actually eat them, so... I don't know. I think if you're overseas, you would. I just don't know whether or not in Australia you'd go and buy yourself a little pack of uh, curried crickets while you're waiting for the bus or something like that. Australians love coffee. There's coffee uh, shops everywhere, even in Caboolture. I'd hate to count the amount of people who sell coffee. Some are fantastic and some are just sort of so-so. But apparently, knocking back five cups of coffee a day could lead to weight gain and increase the risk of diabetes, Australian researchers have warned. While previous studies have shown coffee in moderation can help weight loss and actually reduce the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes, these latest findings suggest that too many coffees a day could have the op- opposite effect due to a substance called uh, cl- uh, chlorogenic acid. The University of Western Australia found that health uh, effects of coffee are dose dependent. Three to four cups a day still seems to have health benefits. Five cups don't. I wonder sometimes whether or not the amount of full milk is something that affects because uh, every time you seem to have a have a coffee, you're always having that incredible amount of milk, of course, which is good for you, but uh, as we get older, I think uh, we have to watch those little things. We spoke to Katie Clift a little while ago, and she's from the Cancer Council, and of course they did the great big morning tea, and uh, of course we've been discussing here for the last um, six years, I think, on food labels, what's good, what's bad, and uh, latest news from the Cancer Council talks about The progress on food labels wins five stars. Cancer Council Queensland has welcomed today's vote of intergovernmental support for new national front-of-pack food labelling based on a star system. Let's face it, it is something we recognise, a star system. The voluntary system features ratings from half a star up to five stars and applies to all manufactured, processed and packaged goods. I think it's fantastic. I I think it's something that will help because, as we've talked to so many people, it can be very confusing, the labelling. But now with the five-star ratings, it will help Queenslanders to choose healthy food and avoid uh, unhealthy options that increase risks, once again, of uh, obesity and cancer. There seem to be words that stick around, the uh, diabetes, obesity, cancer. And it's a sad thing, but I, I, Miss Cliff, I will talk to her. I'll try and get Katie on the phone next week and we'll have a talk about this. Um, the system is very simple. It's easy to understand and improves on the current standard, which often makes food information very confusing for consumers. And it is something that we've talked about. A lot of people feel that um, the labelling system is just so incredibly confusing and uh, I think a lot of the times you'll find that the writing is so small and and uh, let's face it, you have to shop. So it would be fantastic if we can have something that is very, very simple. I think it's a great thing and I'll follow that up because I think it's a worthwhile. When you go into your butcher shops, you notice that um, they have these fantastic little magazines which I, I love to grab and they're produced for, by MLA. They're free, they're seasonal And they're brought to you by The Main Meal, which, of course, you can go on to themainmeal.com.au. I think with winter coming, you start to look for that little bit warmer. And, of course, meals don't have to be expensive, guys. It's just a matter of sometimes putting the the slow cooker on. And we talked about that last week. We talked about some soups. And I thought I'd just share this. It's something I do make regularly at home. It's not expensive to make. And it's a beef uh, ozabuco, and of course you just go to your butcher, asking for if you've got four people, maybe four serves, um, 
and it comes with bone in and you're looking at um, I always just coat mine off in plain flour which they're suggesting in the book here I get a plastic bag put some plain flour in put my pieces of meat in and shake it about then of course you've got so much packaging now there from the supermarkets you don't feel too guilty when you throw that bag out and it's not as messy if you've got it in a um, bowl and you're just browning off your um, Ozabuka in a cast iron pan because, or in a pan that you can actually pop into the oven take your meat out and set aside then you're adding some onions, some celery, parsnips which are just beautiful, cook until golden add a little bit of wine if you want, a cup of red wine if you don't you can just put some stock it does add a lovely intensity to the sauce and of course the alcohol cooks out of it so you've got no problem there with children if you're making dinner for for the little ones um, and then you just let that simmer for about a minute put your meat back on top of the vegetables um, add a can of tomatoes and um, about a cup of beef stock or if you don't have stock you can just put in some water because you will get a lot of juices from the meat and uh, some, add some garlic if you like a little bit of rosemary and uh, cover with a lid and put in the oven for about an hour and a half until the meat is tender and I think it's best if you sort of go on the slow oven about 160 halfway through add a little bit more stock if you're looking at if it's uh, reducing too quickly and at the end of it I make a little gremolata and they talk about that too and a gremolata is a bunch of parsley a clove of garlic a lemon zest um, a lemon totally uh, grated um, a tablespoon of lemon ju juice and a little bit of olive oil and after you've taken and served your meal you just sprinkle the gremolata on top it's amazing this, the uh, taste it brings out. I thought that's a nice, warm, wintry thing. It's freezing out there, guys. Go and get the oven on and rip down to your butcher. At the same time, today we're going to be talking to a wonderful, um, uh, a great story, uh, Sally. She's Taste Trekkers, and she talks about um, so many different foods, a lot of Asian foods, and she does these wonderful trips uh, around Sunnybank and Anala and Chinatown and of course she does uh, overseas also so I thought I, we might share today a Vietnamese style beef roast and uh, it really drew got my attention you, you need a blade beef um, fat trim just ask your butcher about 1.2 kg if you're serving about six people I think it's great to make a little bit more because you have fantastic cold meat for lunch the next day you can have some lemongrass, two tablespoons of lemongrass paste. If you have fresh lemongrass, of course, you'd know the drill. Um, have to bash it up a little bit and cut it very finely. Two tablespoons of fish sauce, three cloves of garlic, one lime juiced, and um, some chilli if you like it. I know that a lot of people get a bit frightened about chilli, but um, pick the right one and you're okay. And uh, so what you do is you mix all those together put some little slits into the blade beef and poke some little star anise and these are the most beautiful little flowers like a dried flower have a look for them they're fantastic that you can use them for so many things and then you put your lemongrass on top of it and pack it all down and uh, then you're roasting in the oven about 220 to get all your vegetables you can have carrots parsnips leeks whatever you want potatoes carrots um, and you put them in the pan, get that going first, have your be beef prepared and then put your um, uh, beef on top and, uh, and just pour your stock or water, about half a cup, over the top of it and roast for 20 minutes and then turn it down to about 160 and you're cooking for another about 40, 40 minutes depending on how you like your beef. Some people like a little bit of red, other people like it well cooked. So of course what you're doing is you're getting a bowl of blade, you're making up your lemongrass mix and you're packing that on top. Put a few slits in there and try and poke it into the beef. The butcher will do that if you ask. Um, put your star anise, get your vegetables going at 220 drizzle them with a bit of oil like you normally do put your beef on top and I tell you what at the end of it you've got all these beautiful vegetables and this fantastic beef creating this nice sauce I thought that just sounded wonderful
stir that with some Asian greens for something a little bit different. Um, you've got all your beautiful parsnips and potatoes and carrots at the bottom of the dish. You don't have to do any more roast veggies. How easy is that? Put it on at lunch and by the time you get back from school, everything's sort of happening and uh, dinner's served. I think it's so nice to be able to bring some different flavours to the, to the good old um, roast beef. And you're using a blade, which of course is not the most expensive beef. Um, and you're serving a fantastically warm a winter, a winter dish. I think it's great. I think we might go to a song. We'll come back very shortly. We'll be right back with more from the Community Kitchen. There's many foods that we uh, should eat and we don't. And uh, it makes me think a little bit about insects when I talk to you about this. But in the paper on the weekend, they were talking about prawn heads. And uh, I must say that uh, watching that um, show, cooking show, which I have to admit I am a little addicted to, I love watching it. Um, no one else in the family does, but I do. And they had deep fried prawn heads. And of course, I think it's just the crunch, but apparently they are very, very rich in antioxidants. Um, Put them on the barbecue next time and give them a go. You can deep fry them, you can add them to your risotto, you can do soups with them. And of course, when you think about peeling a prawn, you are uh, leaving a lot of the good stuff there. So uh, that's one thing. And then you think about a uh, healthy all-rounder is the orange peel. And when you think of what our grandparents did many years ago, every time it was winter, you'd have lots of oranges and lemons in abundance, and they were used in your cooking. There'd be um, lemon peel on your icing or in a pudding, um, there was just so many things that you think back about that there was always a logic to it and we've seemed to lost, have lost a lot of that logic in food. But orange peel is an excellent source of vitamins and minerals um, including calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, uh, potassium and, and phosphorus. It's uh, thought to be very effective in treating many um, conditions. Um, and let's taste it. Let's... Um, admit the taste is just fantastic and if you're using oranges or lemon there's no reason why you can't grate a little bit of that lemon peel on your asparagus or your beans um, use it in your in your veggies it's very very nice and it's so good for you I think it's incredible bananas we talk about that we've had a discussion here a lot of people believe that sometimes they're too busy to eat breakfast and yet bananas are just such a fantastic thing they're packed with uh, potassium and uh, we forget sometimes to grab that beautiful fresh fruit broccolis broccoli and all those greens they're just incredible with the vitamin a um, I think it's amazing when you think about the fact that we take so many vitamins nowadays and I'm sure there's great reason that we do but um, when you think about having a full diet of fresh fruit and vegetables good quality beef, good quality um, seafood and some great breads and, and um, pastas and rice it's, it's amazing what you can do rather than having to uh, boost yourself up with all the different um, vitamins. Looking in the paper today and uh, I noticed that uh, in the food news, I always read the Tuesday food news, news, they were talking about the comparison Matt Moran was, not Matt Moran, Matt Preston was talking about the um, football season starting and what's going to happen with the uh, English and the Australians. He's picked the uh, good old hamburger as the Australian food and I guess in a way when you think about it, hamburger with the pineapple and beetroot, it is very, very Australian. And yet he talks about um, bangers and mash for the uh, English. Interesting, when they talk about their bangers and mash, they tend to talk more about the pork sausage, um, which is interesting because we tend to, in Australia, think of, when we think of sausages, we always think of the beef sausage. But one thing I did love is the fact that he made a fantastic... Um, a sauce with normally you have an onion gravy or something but he's made like a, a more caramelized 
onion to go with uh, onions and a little bit of stock and serve that with the um, the pot- uh, sausages. Sorry, having a little tongue-tied moment here. And interesting enough, the mash that he's recommending, and I think this is a great addition uh, when you're cooking your potatoes just towards the end, add some fresh peas in there and do some little different things because mash doesn't have to be boring. The Scottish, of course, have always done their... Um, cabbage into their potatoes try it with some fresh um, peas I think it looks great and adds that extra little boost to uh, your children's diet I think it's all about trying to get those children interested thinking of which when you're talking about parties too just read this article from Practical Parenting and I know that I've been to some children's parties and sometimes they can just be a complete worry But one of the things that you've got to do, I think, is plan ahead, and they're talking about that in this practical parenting, um, because a lot of the times you can feel very harassed, and I know that that's the time of year that it seems to be holidays are coming up, and I'm sure everyone's going to have some sort of party that they have to attend at that time. And it's nice, isn't it, when you go ahead now, and once upon a time it was just such a nice little thing where you had a bit of fairy bread and ran around and played but nowadays they have jumping castles and they go to professional event coordinators and the expectation is just so high but one of the tips that they reveal here is number one don't let your toddler pick the cake you might have bitten off more than uh, you can chew trying to bake a cake and that really a professional baker would probably have trouble with. It puts so much pressure on yourself, and I think sometimes it simple is good. Stocking up your fridge and your pantry. Preparing the party food requires a few days planning. However, it will save parents a, a sleepless night before the big day if you can actually get a few little things out of the way. And ask a friend or a mum to look after the birthday boy so that you can actually get a few hours to make sure everything's up And uh, it's nice to be able to do that. I know I've been to a couple where you've got um, someone's come along and helped a little bit earlier. just takes the sweat off. It seems ridiculous we're talking about a child's party, but as they say, the expectations now are so high, it can put an incredible amount of um, pressure on people. I think as uh, the old song I use for our... uh, 101.5 101.5 Community Kitchen. Got to keep it simple. I think we've lost the art of just keeping things nice and simple, and it does make a very big difference to everyone's life. We'll go to a song, and uh, we'll be back shortly. And welcome back. I have my guest online, Sally from Taste Trekkers. Good morning. Hi, Matt. How are you? Are you better? <laughs> I I am, but Jesus, it takes a long time to get over that pneumonia. <laughs> it's because you um, you were lucky enough to go to Italy for a trip, I think. I was. Mm, I, I was, played up too much in Italy. <laughs> oh, that's. I, I've heard that can happen over there. Good food, good <laughs> wine. <laughs> I like a good time. Uh, look, I, I have really enjoyed finding your business on the on the uh, internet. I Google everything, and I, I come across this taste trekkers, and I thought I really have to talk to this person. You do some fantastic things, uh-huh. and I love your little food. We talked to Feast Magazine, and I think that's where it all sort of started with me, and I started looking about it. What's available in Brisbane? You take people for tours around Sunnybank, Chinatown, in Arla. Mm. It's good. I just like to... Um, I think people are quite intimidated when they walk into another, you know, grocery store. They don't know what everything is and everyone's bustling around. So it's really great, actually. We just wander around and we kind of just, you know, tell people what all those tins and dry bits and <laughs> <laughs> bottles and jars and things are all for it's great we just swap recipes and chat and I tell them about my favorite products and you know inevitably someone will come and gate crash our group and we end up discussing generally Vietnamese recipes and it's really fun and so it really just takes away all the mystery and the intimidation out of it and, you know quite often I'll be wandering around and I see them see the people that have been on a walk with me back shopping there so it's great is it just your love of food that started Look at all this. I'm a yeah. bit obsessed with. I'm a bit of a food junkie. I love it. <laughs> and yet, you've sort of had a, have a real Asian feel to your to your trips. And Look, I do. I um, was a chef for many years. Um, 
And when I was younger, I could work for six months and then travel for six months. And Asia was cheap. Mm. <laughs> and I was young and didn't have much money. And um, I always used to think, ah, Europe, it's been the same for thousands of years. It'll stay that way. I'll see that when I've got some money. Mm. And I would travel to Asia and it was great. So I just became obsessed and I love it. And it was funny, we were talking the other day and we were talking about the smell of a durian. You know, it smells very gassy and mm. it's quite disgusting. But I love it. To me, durian mixed in with... <laughs> Um, bicycle fumes is beautiful. It's like you'd get off the plane and you're like, oh, I love that smell. <laughs> <laughs> I remember watching a movie and uh, the guy uh, used to say, I love um, the smell of napalm in the morning. And <laughs> it was a Vietnam movie and I thought, that's incredible, isn't it? But, you know, when you do go to a lot of places overseas, there are so many different smells, especially when you go to different Asian countries and there's mm. they're unfamiliar smells to us. Mm. It's, it's funny because... I love it, but I think that's because I've been doing it for so long. And so for me, it's quite familiar and it's like, oh, great, I'm back. You know, I remember though, um, my husband and I, we got married back in 2000 in Bali and my mum and dad came over, of course, and my father is a farmer. And um, <laughs> he rocked up to the hotel and said, man, I don't know what they're doing out there, but it's chaos and it stinks. <laughs> I said, oh, he said, oh, they think they brought us in a back way. I said, no, that was the main street. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so, you know, he hadn't travelled much, of course. I mean, we're lucky now, of course, because we travel a lot. Mm. And uh, my father's older, and so he didn't travel as much. And he'd obviously never been to Asia, but he just thought it was terrible. He didn't like it at all. <laughs> so you do your trips. Like, I mean, I noticed that you've got your little trek trips around. You can do the sun, Sunnybank Asian foodie trek, and then you can go to Chinatown mm -hmm. and uh, in Nala. I, mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting because you don't really put that much. I, I didn't imagine that Asia uh, that Inala had a huge Asian um, influence. Oh, it's very Asian. It's funny. I've probably been going out there for five or six years, but. Mm -hmm. It's very much Vietnamese, okay. um, and it's thriving. It's uh, for me, I like it more than Sunnybank, only because there's, you know, there's lots of street food on the weekend. It's almost, I mean, you could literally be in Ho Chi Minh. The men are in the middle of the square, and they're all playing mahjong and drinking, you know, bubble teas and coffee and. Um, it's just fantastic. There's a great vibe. There's all the fruit and veggies out, you know, on the footpath. And it's every single shop is full and packed. And um, it's going fantastically well for them out there. And it's great. And more and more, um, I suppose, with the tours and as people become aware of it, mm. um, there's more people shopping out there. So it's great. I do all my shopping out there. <laughs> so Sunnybank has, would you say, more of a Chinese influence in its area? Yes, I think so. It's just a little bit... Um, I mean, I know Sunnybank was very Chinese. I have even read something the other day, um, I think it was on Twitter, they were saying, should we relocate, you know, Chinatown to Sunnybank? Well, yes, I think we should because there's definitely more atmosphere out there and, you know, it's... Um, it's got its own little vibe going on. But, yes, it's not Vietnamese. It's definitely Chinese, a bit Taiwanese. Okay. Mm. Can't do that, but because for us who live on the north side, we wouldn't be able to buy our Chinese duck and our goodies in Chinatown no. if it was relocated. <laughs> Sunnybank's a little bit too far. <laughs> Can't do that. I know. You kind of miss out over there on the north side, don't you? <laughs> Uh, well, it has been said sometimes that that happens, but um, we do have other things over this side which are quite nice. So um, you do your food tracks. Now you do these in Australia, but you also go overseas. Where do you? What do you do overseas? So I do lots of different things. My next one overseas is Japan, mm -hmm. um, which is great. What I try and do is deliver a holiday that you're not going to get on your own. Okay. I'm not going to give you a holiday that you're going to go to Japan and have by yourself. So um, 
for instance, we're going down to the southern island of Kaishu yeah. and we're going up into the mountains to a place called Gokatasho, which is the home of the last samurai. And we get to stay like with 40, 49th generation samurai families and we cook with them and, you know, they take us fishing and we go for walks and it's really beautiful. And then, you know, we've got another part where we go to Mount Asso and we meet a beef farmer and his family and, you know, we sit around and have a barbecue. <laughs> so it's really, we do some really quite interesting things. With Japan, actually, I'm lucky. I've got, um, I've talked Jane Lawson who has just written a book called Zen Boo Zen. And um, she lived in, she was a publisher with Murdoch. Okay. And she was a chef and she was burnt out and she went and lived in Japan for a few years and just wanted to get back to, you know, a nice tranquil state of mind. <laughs> and because she was a chef and loved food, um, she's written this beautiful cookbook. Anyway, she's coming with me. So we're going to spend four days in Kyoto and just kind of hang out with Jane's friends. <laughs> sounds, <laughs> like, sounds like you have a great job. Now, yeah. what were you doing when I spoke to you a, a month or so ago? You were just headed to um, to Italy. So was mm-hmm. this another trip that you went on? Well, what I do is quite often I... Other people... This That was with a Sicilian friend of mine. She wanted to start food tours. Mm-hmm. And um, hers were different as well, as in go to Sicily and really it's hanging out with her family. We would spend mornings with her nonna talking about recipes and, you know, we'd go to um, her sis- her cousin's place and we would make sausages and pasta and we'd cook in their outdoor oven and pick fruit from the orchard and it was great in the fact that the whole town just embraced us, you know, and it was very different. You couldn't have that holiday just rocking up by yourself to Sicily. Mm, it's fantastic. So it was just a really fun time. They, the whole town threw a party for us and I walked in and there was a 75-year-old with us on the trip and she was up on the bar dancing. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds like you do have fun on your trips. <laughs> so they were, it was fun times. I mean, we, you know, we did lots of beautiful stuff. We went to a place called Piemonte, which is gorgeous, and we met the local butcher. And, you know, he took us and introduced us to some friends of his that had just bought this amazing vineyard. It was called Fagotto. And it, back in its heyday, it was a winemaking place and it had a whole village. And he bought it up. He was a lawyer and he bought it up and he was renovating it to be a B&B and a you know, place where people can get married. So it was just little crazy things like that happened all the time. We'd be driving around in this bus going to somewhere thinking we're just having a normal day out. And then all of a sudden we'd pull over and 10 relatives would jump in and we'd be scooting off to, you know, a tomato... <laughs> A tomato shed and there'd be a barbecue with pork and fennel sausages on it and all the workers would come out and cook us lunch. It was just great. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, you do cooking classes also. I do, yes. And they're, they're quite different. You go from all over the place. You do Moroccan, you do uh, Spanish. Yeah, um, and I suppose it just kind of... I kind of tap into what people are looking for at the time and that really does change. A few years ago, everyone just wanted to learn Thai. Mm. Or I could have done, you know, six Thai classes a week. Yes. Then it all changed and people were interested in Spanish, you know, and at the moment it's going through a bit of a um, South American mm. kind of vibe. People are after that. I mean, the Asian stuff always stays. I think we're so close in the South Pacific region and, you know, Asia's become such a part of our life. We grow the same fruit and vegetables. We have access to all the same produce that, you know, we're kind of moving to that way of cooking. So I think Asian cookery will always be top of the pop. I noticed with the South American, it, it's so similar to us, isn't it, in many ways. It's just that they have, like when you talk about barbecue, um, mm. the ingredients are the same. It's just it's put together so differently. Yes, it's just a few little, it's kind of interesting. They eat a lot of 
barbecued meat. Mm. Um, lots and lots and lots. And then they have all these different sauces that go with it that are a bit, you know, the chimichurri, which is, you know, a little bit spicy and mm. herbaceous. And they do these... Um, I'm quite lucky. My brother is married to a Peruvian girl. Okay. And so our family has spent a bit of time in Peru. And um, so I've, you know, been... I've done a lot of Peruvian cooking. And I find this difference is how we thicken things. You know, we use a lot of flour and butter and different things like that. They will use, like, pretzels and biscuits or bread as a thickening agent or a base for a sauce. Is that so, a traditional thing that they've done? Yes. Oh, okay. It is. I've got stuff, you know, there's lots of stuffed vegetables, potatoes and things, but they might whiz up bread and that becomes the base of your sauce. And then you might put, you know, pureed capsicums through it and a little bit of chilli and a bit of spice and maybe, you know, some parsley and there's your sauce. Mm. kind of makes sense, really. It does in a way. I, I mean, that, that's the, that's what I find so interesting. I mean, looking at the whole different thing, and I'm just looking at some printouts here from I took off your, your um, uh, website, yeah. and and just looking at the different like boutique barbecue. And when you think of boutique barbecue, I mean, nothing is nicer than pork belly, in my opinion. I I, just, yeah. I love pork belly. <laughs> And yet there's so many different types and so many different chefs who use so many different types of cooking, yet fundamentally it all comes back to the Chinese. And yeah. yet we've changed it such a, you know, along the way and it's sort of adapted into our culture now, hasn't it? Yeah. I love how we do that food. Mm. Was, I have this um, one particular day. I was sitting in a restaurant oh, in the middle of Spain somewhere and I was with a chef from Melbourne his name was um, Frank Camora. He runs the Movita restaurant. And we were luckily enough to be in this beautiful restaurant eating lunch. And out of the place came an anchovy on a piece of bread with half a slice of tomato and a sprig of curly parsley. Okay. <laughs> to which I turned to him and I said, you could not serve this in Australia. You just could not get away with it. I said, we are so spoiled. Mm. Our food is so incredible. You know, if you got served this, you would think, you know, what kind of restaurant is this? They're still using curly parsley. <laughs> <laughs> but we had quite an interesting conversation with the chef about how there's countries that are so old and they do things so traditionally. As Australians, we travel all the time. You know, we go and see things all the time. So we're always bringing back other people's food and making it our own. Mm. And I love that. I kind of feel, you know, one of the girls on the trip in Italy, in Sicily, said, oh, I do better Italian than this. <laughs> I mean, you can't say that. It's not the same. She goes, I know, isn't that terrible? She said, I said that when I went to Vietnam as well. And so it's kind of interesting because we do do very good versions. <laughs> but we do have very good ingredients, and this is this is one thing that people sort of <clears throat> I always have a little panic on the show here, trying to stress to people that the respect of our farmers, because you know we have such beautiful produce in Australia, mm. and when you look at the food that we eat and how much we eat and the quality of the food that we eat daily, and yet I can remember talking to someone in the north of Thailand, and I said to him, what would your daily meal be, your weekly shopping be? And he said, rice. And so really, they have rice. And then if it's really, really quiet, they can have frogs. You know, if they don't have enough money, they can have frogs and they can have this and that. And, yeah. I mean, it's the last thing in, a, in an Australian's mind that they may be able to, um, they'd have to change their, their beef or their pork or their chicken and have a char grill frog. Yeah. It just would not go down very well if you put that on the family table. And yet it is something that happens a lot overseas where you were saying like one anchovy with a piece of curly parsley, I bet it tastes fine. Oh, it was fantastic. Exactly. And that's the point I'm making is that if I wasn't told it was a frog, I could probably actually enjoy those great big frogs grilled on the barbecue. It's yeah. just the fact that we have become so spoiled and we just expect that we would have three good meals a day with abundant produce. Yes, I know. We are very spoiled. And, you know, 
it's kind of one of the things I like about going away. You always come back and go, oh, Jimmy, we are the lucky country. <laughs> I have been reminding my listeners this morning, but that we do have um, insects on the um, on the horizon. I think in Australia, with the the lack of um, affordability for protein in the future, they keep saying that we're going to be have to have to eat insects. But it is something that you would have eaten on your travels, no doubt. <laughs> Yes, I've eaten frogs, in fact. I had a beautiful frog <laughs> curry when I was in Thailand last. And insects, I mean, you know, yes, I've eaten insects. They just end up being crunchy little bits of protein. You can't, you don't really even think about it. Mm. So let's just go to your, to your trips because we're just about going to be running out of time. So if people actually want to go and, and have a little journey around Anala or journey about Sunnybank, how do they do this? Pop onto my website. It's uh, www.tastetrekkers, and that's trekkers with a double K, so dot com dot au. Um, and on there, I just have all my walks. You know, you can just click on if it says an Anala walk, click on there, and the dates will come up, and you can pick a date. I generally do those during the week, though, and I do that for a reason because on the weekend you can hardly hear yourself think. Oh, I'm so busy. It's so busy. If I take people on the weekend, if you've got a group of four, I'll take you on the weekend. Um, but generally, I don't organise groups because I can't take any more than that because we'll just get, you know, spread, you won't hear me. Um, so generally, I take them on a Tuesday where we have a little bit more of a free run. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the other cooking classes are on there as well, and they're just kind of randomly spread. I generally do those on Thursday, Friday, Saturdays. Um, and the overseas food tours, they are at all different times. As I said, the next one is in October, at the end of October, and then the next one after that, I think, is Vietnam. So you're doing, you're doing Japan in October, so we might touch base with you after you come back with that and talk about Japan because I'm sure there's a lot of people interested in doing that, listening yeah, to that. Yeah, Japan's it, amazing. It'll yeah. be absolutely beautiful because, once again, there's so many ingredients, as you say, that people just don't understand. You walk into the Chinese shop and you've got no idea except you've been reading this fantastic cookbook. <laughs> and they're telling you that you have to use all these ingredients. And you've, and I, I guess now with kabocha, we have, um, someone was saying that we have something like 85 different nationalities here. Wow. And we do have quite a few shops that are starting to look after, you know, the, the taste if you want to go shopping. And it's surprising that um, even supermarkets, I know, are starting to get in on the run of it and having quite a good selection of goodies. But nothing's like going into and smelling and enjoying all the different um, flavours that one particular market would offer. I think that would be yeah. the different, wouldn't it? Mm, mm. No, it's... Um, I think once you get your head around a different bunch of flavours, it's kind of easy. I find people go and they'll buy a jar of soy chili paste because <laughs> they need it for a recipe and then they don't know what to do with it. I think that is the problem. Yeah. yeah. And so your trip sort of take to, uh, trek sort of shows you that you can use this and then diverse and, and use it for something else. Yeah. So it's a bit like this is what this is used for and, you know, if you've got some left over, do this and, you know, always or put it in salad dressing and... So a lot of it is about, once again, it's what we were talking about before. I use lots of Asian ingredients, but not so much in Asian dishes. You know, like lots of stuff you can whack in salad dressings and pop on some beautiful, you know, mixed green leaves and just gives you some unusual, you know... Flavours, yeah. Yeah, so we talk about a lot of that kind of things. you know, using the wonton wrappers and stuff as ravioli cases or popping bananas in them and making a dessert and mm. putting them with salted caramel. So it's not Asian as such, but you're using Asian products. Uh, so there's a restaurant in Kabulcha that does a uh, chocolate, fried chocolate wontons. Oh, yum. I know. It's quite, they're <laughs> very nice, actually. <laughs> so <they're>, therefore, <laughs> once again, you've got that little bit of a blend, which is fantastic. Sally, thank you for taking the time to talk. I'm pleased you're over your pneumonia and um, back from your, <laughs> your Italy pa- Italian party. Mm-hmm. And um, no doubt we'll talk again. And uh, it's just fantastic to talk to you. I think it's a fantastic thing for people to actually get in there and learn 
learn some of these uh, ingredients because even myself, someone who loves food, it can be quite intimidating finding, um, you know, going into one of the shops and thinking, what on earth is this? <laughs> Where do I start? Where do I start? Thank you, Sally. <laughs> That's a pleasure. Lovely to speak to you. You Anne. too. Bye so bye. that's Sally from Taste Trekkers. And uh, it's almost done for us today. We've talked about getting some nice warm foods in there uh, into your family diet. I think it's just the perfect time of year when you know that you um, can have a soup and maybe a pudding. Um, remember those beautiful puddings that your mum used to make? Lovely creamy rice, nice steamed pudding, cho- chocolate self sourcing. Um, get out the old books and have a look. It's worthwhile. Thanks for listening, and I'll be with you next week.